Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to our event celebrating the launch of Experimental Games, a new book by University of Chicago professor Patrick Jagoda. This event is presented in collaboration with the Seminary Co-op Bookstore as part of our new virtual event series by the book Smart Talks with Chicago Authors. This series aims to bring big ideas and smart conversation directly to you. We have some great events coming up, so please continue to check our events calendar. I'll include a link to that in the chat. I just wanted to share a few ground rules before we get started. Um, we'll plan for this event to last about an hour, and we will have a time for an audience question and answer portion at the end. We'll also have some interactive questions coming up here pretty quickly. Um, so please do keep your microphones muted throughout the event. Um, to reduce background noise. But if you have questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, feel free to place them in the chat. Um, I do also just want to remind everyone that Experimental Games is available for purchase through the Seminary Co-op, and I'll include a link to the book in the chat as well. And now I'll introduce our guests. Patrick Dugoda is Professor of English and Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. He is a Guggenheim Fellow and Executive Editor of Critical Inquiry. He is the author of Network Aesthetics, which is also published by the University of Chicago Press. We're also joined by Alenda Y. Chang, Associate Professor in Film and Media Studies at UC Santa Barbara, where she co-directs the Wireframe Media Studio. She's also founding co-editor of the Open Access Journal, Media and Environment. And we're also joined by Ashlyn Sparrow, Assistant Director of the Weston Game Lab at the University of Chicago. So now I'll turn everything over to our guests. Great, what, one of you should start. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, you know, in the, in the spirit of experimental games and experimental performance and experimental everything, uh, we thought it would be fun to uh, perhaps do some audience participation, but through the power of Kahoot. Now, I am curious if any of you have heard of Kahoot, but if you haven't, it is a, uh, a kind of quiz-based application online. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Oh, uh, Meredith, can you make me the host? Because I cannot share a screen. Perfect. All right. Okay, everyone. So in, oh, no, okay. In order to make this happen, you will need a smartphone device, such as your, you know, phone here. What you'll want to do is you want to go to www.kahoot.it. When you get to that website, you will want to enter into this game pen. And what will end up happening is we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a series of questions and, you know, just to get some responses. And then we will proceed with the amazingness that is this event. Thank you. Look at everyone getting in here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, Patrick, Alinda, if you want to get in on this, like, feel free to. I feel like I don't want to bias the results. I mean, that's fair. <laughs> this is a very serious survey, as you can tell by the music. The most serious, OK? <laughs> Oh, yes for this mint penguin. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, how many participants do we have? Seventy something. Oh, amazing. Okay, so seventy seven. Okay, great. Like look at us. Making our way. Oh, the emojis. The emojis, yes. Computer meets the, yes. That's great. Ashlyn, what's the uh, game pin? Uh, the game pin is 179 2776. And once you put that in, it'll ask you for a nickname. And feel free to put, you know, Whatever you like, please be, you know, kind. Mm 
So you probably weren't expecting this when you came to the book event, but here we are. Look, we have a Chicago Shane. I'm curious if there are like other Shanes from other cities here. And I think, you know, you'll be able to continue to uh, join in. The pen will still be on the screen. But you know what? I'm going to, the, the slowdown is happening. I'm going to go ahead and press start. Okay? Let's do it. Experimental Games, welcome. <laughs> First question, you'll look at it on your screen. I will read it out loud. It's a word cloud. So what do you consider yourself to be? I'm curious about who you all are. Are you students, professors, game designers, researchers? Like what what are what are you? Nine seconds. Time is running out. Oh, yes. The stakes are much okay. higher. Like, so. I'm curious what this large one is here. Like, what is happening? It's just curious. Adoring fan. Human. Someone here is Merlin. Oh, my gosh. Students. Nice. Okay. Oh. So we have a majority <laughs> of students here. That's we, we have our winner. We have our winner. We have a finance. We have just finance here. Yes, a learner. Oh, this is so good. Okay, so we've got a diversity. This is great. All right. Next question. Also a word cloud. What are some of your favorite games? Oh my goodness. Yeah, you only also like I only gave y'all like 30 seconds for this to really like get down to the core favorite game. Can't overthink it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> Believe in yourself. That's our job, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I really hope this is like Stardew Valley or something. The Animal Crossing. <laughs> oh. Hey, ah! I told you, Patrick, you tried it. You really tried it. Uh, one of your questions should actually be about how Patrick feels about Animal Crossing New Horizons. You should definitely ask that question. We forgot that one. We forgot that one, yeah. We definitely forgot to ask that question. Okay. Uh, last question. I think uh, I think I have two more questions before we get started with this event. What color should Patrick dye his hair next? Right now it's purple. <laughs> he had uh, green hair at one point, um, and it was. Uh, we also did blue, right? So like you know, tell us what he should dye his hair. Shades are also appropriate here. We can also go back to like standard brown, maybe. This is testing your capacity for interactivity. This is, this is merely a test. Or is it a suggestion? Hmm. What is this? What's in it? Oh my goodness. Oh, flamingo. Oh, flamingo. Pink. Orange. <laughs> That's so good. Really? Patrick. This historical moment? All right. Patrick, <laughs> as the audience has spoken, I do like a good chartreuse. Thank you to the people who put that in there and spelled it correctly. Such that it's big. Okay. Okay. Last question or no? All right. And then the last question we'll ask is what does experimental mean to you? I love when Kahoot gives you backhanded compliments like that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> you want to rethink that? <laughs> the fun, spacey, inspiring, playful, mm. new horizons. Mm. Oh, I like this. Trying new things and Not being expected. unexpected. Oh, this is good. This is fantastic. Okay. Negative capability. I'm going to keep this, you know, in the background. Keep your phones nearby as I know you all will. Uh, we will return to Kahoot throughout our event here. Um, but in the meantime, let me just stop sharing. Oh, how do I stop sharing the screen? There we go. Okay. Okay, I guess. Yeah, I it. think um, I think uh, Ashlyn and I are going to offer.
kind of our hot take on, on what <laughs> Patrick's book means to us. Um, so is it okay if I go ahead, start with yeah, my yeah. Okay, and I, um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming and just, uh, I'm so happy to be part of this event. And um, I'm kind of cheating because I got to read this at an early stage <laughs> so I can refer to my notes, which is really nice. Um, so, you know, I would say that experimental games is, um, it's, it's, it's beautifully written, it's lucid, it's original and nuanced, it's well-researched. Um, and it brings together many different areas of thinking that I don't think have necessarily been put together before. And, and I have a question for Patrick about that, so I won't say too much. Um, but I think, you know, for me, if I had to summarize, I'd say the argument is um, that games in general, but uh, mostly digital games in this case, should be considered as experimental objects or processes in their own right. Um, and I think, you know, Patrick can talk about this, but I think there's this desire to liberate experimental discourse and experimental um, behavior from the sciences and from um, business innovation discourse. Um, and I think this project has a really interesting historical and interdisciplinary scope and, you know, goes back to the mid 20th century and talks about these conditions that really set, sort of set the stage for how we encounter games and play in the 21st century. So, um, and then just to be a little bit more specific, I think um, Patrick does this amazing job of thinking about um, the kind of sexiness, the allure of gamification um, and um, thinking about how the post-war kind of post-industrial growth of neoliberalism and informatics um, has kind of informed the development of games. But then despite all these things that seem like dangerous red flags, um, still manages to rescue games and play um, as, as something that's you know, to be cherished and to be valued. Um, and that can, in his words, um, make better problems um, for us today. And also not just sort of simulate reality, but really think about how we can together um, construct and envision better, better realities. And I think um, if anything, this past week <laughs> has shown us how important um, and how, um, you know, how critical that mission is. Um, so that's, that's my sort of take. Pass it over to Ashlyn. Wonderful. Um, so I, you know, I'm coming at this very much as a gamer and game designer. So, you know, when I think of this, I, I think it's safe to say that games are the largest cultural and entertainment forms of our time right now, right? Like pre-COVID, and I like, as I call it, the before time, you know, thousands of people would come into parks and play Pokemon Go, right? Gather in large stadiums to play League of Legends, right? And even as COVID has been happening, you know, games have just gotten larger and larger, right? We have Animal Crossing New Horizon and it's sold more than 26 million copies, right? And we also have a half a billion players, you know, playing among us in November and just November alone. So games have just consumed so much of our time, our attention, and more importantly, really our capital, right? And games are so popular that they've begun to influence our everyday lives. And the practice of gamification, this idea of using game mechanics and traditional non-game activities is all around us, right? We have photography, Fitbit, My Fitness Pal, Nike Plus, gamifying exercise, Khan Academy, gamifying education and learning, and consumer rewards programs actually even gamifying loyalty, right? But these psychological, behavioral, and economic design practices are not actually a recent phenomenon. And in experimental games, Patrick Jagoda has definitely uh, uh, connected the rise of games and gamification to neoliberalism. The language of competition, leaderboards, and points have taken over mundane aspects of our lives. Where does that leave games? How might we push the simple idea of gamification and neo neoliberal thought and use games as a form of experimentation that allows its players to shift that relationship with the world. In experimental games, Jagoda, as a game designer and media scholar, rigorously uncovers the social political aspects of game design by reorienting the affordances of games using affect theory. Quite often, gamers and designers talk about pro providing a series of interesting choices, giving players ultimate and complete control, selecting game difficulty at the mechanical level, or providing a space for failure so that players may learn and try again. Experimental games move beyond just the visual uh, aesthetics, calculated decisions, and surface level emotions. As, designer, as a designer, Jagoda further expands the uh, intangible sensations of game design books, 
such as Gain Feel by Stephen Swink, to move us beyond the realm of the unconscious and the subconscious. And so I'm really excited to talk with Patrick today about his book, talk with Alinda about, you know, these questions that we have, you know, and it's, you know, get some intellectual knowledge about what games can do for us in this time period. Great. I just want to say before we ask this, do the first question thing, I just <laughs> wanted to really quickly thank both of you for being here. You've both been so important to me uh, over the last decade. I mean, Alenda, we've had so many conversations around game studies and been part of the same circles. And I think we have many of the same shared concerns. And I do very quickly want to say, you all should check out Playing Nature, <laughs> um, which is inverted here. But uh, Playing Nature is a book about ecology and video games, which is fantastic that Alenda has written and Ashlyn and I have had a chance to collaborate uh, with other people in this space in this Zoom, Zoom call as well uh, on a number of games over the last 10 years. So it's just wonderful to get to uh, get to talk to you all for a little bit. Wonderful. Um, I, maybe I can kick off with the, the, the question for Patrick, which is what drove you to write this particular book at the time that you did, um, which is the sort of Bogart question <laughs> of all the gin <laughs> joints, right? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think every book I've worked on or, or want to work on begins with a concept that causes me discomfort. And so with my first book, I focused on the network, which has so many different meanings and valences. Plus, it's a concept that doesn't have clear cut politics to it, right? It can just as readily signal uh, neoliberal governance or a corporate version of the internet as it can uh, forms of interconnectedness or resistance. And games and gamification in this book are very similar for me. Like on the one hand, it's easy to align video games with the mil military industrial complex or with late capitalism. Uh, on the other hand though, games have uh, aesthetic uniqueness and a relationship to computational systems that makes them a much more powerful cultural force in the status quo than I would argue even uh, print literature and film, both of which are dear to me as well. And that tension between uh, what games are and what games can be, even, even that contradiction motivated me to write this book. And I would just end by saying that like personally, this was also a project for me of figuring out what kind of game designer I wanna be over the next decade, right? If video games are complicit with histories of empire, capitalism, militarism, sexism, racism, and so forth, uh, what does it mean to make games that both acknowledge and exceed those kinds of coordinates. And I think it's uh, not enough for the content of a game to be anti-colonialist or something. It's also a matter of what a game does to you as a player in a medium specific way, right? How it impacts your body, your thinking, your habits, uh, your beliefs, your ways of moving through the world. Yeah, I think that's very similar to my experience writing Playing Nature too, which was, trying to sort of answer for myself this question of, should I be throwing all of my game consoles in the trash? <laughs> you know, if I wanna be like an environmentally conscious person, you know, so it's, uh, you know, it's, I like that it's like this working through for you, um, a wrestling with your own design philosophy. So Ashlyn, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that struck me um, is this, portion where you're talking about the over emphasis of psychology and neurology and game design. And I'm, and you're wanting a push towards the more theoretical, affective and philo philosophical aspects of design. And so I'm curious about your, your thoughts there and why designers should start moving towards the latter. Yeah, I mean, this, this is also like a big uh, driving force for me with this book was basically the, the world of serious games has too much of a problem solution mindset right now, which is borrowed from Silicon Valley, right? This is the idea that basically there's no social or political problem that can't be solved through technology. And this is a very dominant ideology in our time, right? It's also often an alibi for awful behavior in the present, right? So it's the idea that it's okay to keep producing or overproducing CO2 emissions at an alarming rate because surely technology will arrive on the scene just in time to save us from climate change disasters, for instance. And I think this mindset is also too common in serious game design. So um, Jane McGonigal, for instance, uh, you know, whose work I've been very inspired by, um, really kind of for me over celebrates the saving power of games or behavioral economics is an example of a discipline that um, over celebrates 
what it means to create like nudges or behavior modifications that can change the way that people fundamentally act. And so much of game design begins with psychology, begins with behavioral theories. And uh, part of my move in this book was a very humanist move, right? It was to say, if we started with aesthetics, if we started with philosophy, um, if we started with literary thought, let's say, and designed our games with that in mind rather than behavioral modification, uh, where, where would that lead us? And part of my answer is through this distinction between um, problem solving and problem making. Um, and I think there's a real value in games that raise complex problems and make problems that didn't uh, previously exist, which seems like a bad thing, but I, I argue is a, is a very good thing, um, rather than simply trying to like make people better at math, which I think some games can do, right? I'm not, I'm not opposed to like the math games of the world, but. I could use that for my seven year old right now. <laughs> I, I'm seeing gamification writ large right now in all of the educational tech that's being deployed. But um, that actually kind of gets at the question I was going to ask you about what your disciplinary influences were for this book, because mm. I do think it's such a really unusual mel melding of, um, you know, there's the behavioral economics and um, actual game theory. So if you're not a game studies insider, <laughs> you probably don't realize there's a distinction between game theory and game studies, which is actually quite distinct. Um, but then also, you know, there's a kind of a course through the book from these earlier models to um, a real emphasis on affect and performance. And I do think performance and the body really start to figure largely toward the end of the book. And, um, and maybe, you know, we can head toward thinking a little bit about embodiment and um, like the importance of, of the player's sensorium, <laughs> I guess, in, in, in playing video games or not even video games and playing games generally. Yeah. I mean, this question of disciplinary orientation was, was surprising to me like while I started working on this book. So I ended up reading much more in the history of economics and business literature than I ever expected or ever wanted to read. Uh, so, so um, you know, you, you, you can thank me for the for the nasty, messy work that happened there. Just kidding. Um, but, <laughs> but, I, but, but I did delve into those disciplines more than I expected. And my main coordinates ended up being, like you're saying, economic game theory, uh, behavioral economics, and debates from the 1970s to the present about um, the so-called free market or neoliberal economics. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're right that beyond that kind of historical foundation in economics, I was interested in moving into cultural studies, queer theory, affect theory, uh, literary and film studies, and performance studies. And, and actually, Alenda, early in the in the process of this book, um, when when you read it, you made me feel okay about this not necessarily being a game studies book in the, <laughs> in the narrower sense. And I actually like I, I think the same of your book. I think. There's, there's, there are a whole lot of amazing close readings of games in your book, but actually it's a book about environmental studies and media in a much deeper way where games are taken as the case. And, um, and I think one thing that we have in common is the idea that games and scientific experimentation intersect in many ways. And I think you draw your examples from biological and environmental studies experiments uh, for the most part. And I more often draw from fields like public health and social science experimentation. So like when I use that word experimental in my book, um, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in like a subset of avant-garde games necessarily. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the ways that both the sciences and the arts have taken up that concept and the ways in which, you know, hypothesis generation and the hypothesis testing are, are not the province purely of the sciences, but, but uh, do play out in the arts in a number of different ways. And I really think of games as uh, artificial constructions that nudge and modulate reality's potentials in a variety of ways. And I think if we, if we only understand better how it is that they do that with computation as a component, um, then there are better directions that we can go in terms of game design in the next you know, 10 to 50 years. Mm. And really quickly, because you know, we asked our audience what does experimental mean to them, right? And and that it, it uh, includes things like being inspiring, playful, testing, you know, trying new things, open-ended, failure is possible, seeing what happens. How are you defining, you know, uh, experimental here, um, so that you know we can all be kind of on the same page as what we're, you know, all talking about? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I like I'm drawing like like for me, it is partially hypothesis testing in the way that the science is defined with like independent and dependent variables and all that fun stuff. Um, I do at times like also look at the history of experimental art and experimental literature, uh, going back to like Zola and the experimental novel or thinking about experimental film. Um, and then I guess as a third note, I'm also interested in the way that uh, contemporary businesses and corporations use the language of experimentation, not to mean the kind of rigorous lab-based experiment, for instance, or the kind of, you know, even mesocosmic experiment um, that you're talking about, Alenda, in your book, um, but something that's like much more open-ended, like the kind of stuff that happens with product testing. Um, and, and so like, I try to take those three nodes, science, art, and economics, um, and think about how games are drawing from and ch channeling those forces of, uh, of not just discovery, which is the way that we think about experimentation sometimes, but construction, right? Experiments are like theater to me. They, they make things in the world. They don't, they don't merely find them. The way that you design an experiment uh, has a lot to do with how people understand it and, and take up those findings. Um, like I th think a lot about the you know, Stanford prison experiment or something, right? For all of the flaws, it was taken up as such a controversial and important case because of the ways that it was staged. Uh, ditto for a number of other experiments in psychology and, and probably other fields. Maybe that, that kind of leads to, um, well, you know, why bring in neoliberalism? <laughs> um, so I think there's a, you're trying to um, distinguish experimentation from gamification. I was actually, in my brain, I was kind of thinking about this in terms of, um, gamification, which is actually kind of vilified in a lot of game design circles as being this really kludgy way to approach um, to, to kind of import or game mechanics into non-game situations. Yeah. Um, but then also equally these, these things that people like McGonagall celebrate, like the positive psychological experience of flow, like that, that state that you achieve when you're really intent and like absorbed in the game. And I feel like experimentation for you is a concept that disrupts both of those paradigms. And maybe you can talk <laughs> talk about neoliberalism as well. As, as well, okay. I'll start with neoliber neoliberalism and try to do something with, with flow. Um, so, you know, and, and, I, and I really struggled whether neoliberalism was the term that I wanted to focus on in this book. And after going back and forth and reading a bunch of things, I realized that like, yes, it actually was. And so like at the beginning of this book, I start with a very simple observation, which is that both neoliberalism as an economic paradigm and video games took off at about the same time in the 1970s and the 1980s. And of course, like, you know, neoliberal theory goes back to Hayek's, at least like the road to surf them in the 19, in 1944, um, but it doesn't really gain economic traction until the 1970s and it doesn't enter uh, mainstream politics in the Anglo-American world until the 1980s. And the same is true for video games, right? You have early experiments in the 50s and 60s with like early chess programs and space war, um, but it's not until the 1970s that arcades and Atari games take off and it's and NES and, and, and Sega really take off in the 1980s. So that was a very simple observation is like, why are these things happening at the same time? And I was never interested in a causal argument, right? It's not like economics and politics led to the success of video games. And it's not like video games caused uh, neoliberalism or computation even caused neoliberalism, but there's an interesting co-emergence of the two. And so I'm really tracking historically how that happens, especially since the late forties. Um, and we see, you know, like the simplest way of putting this is we, we see this a lot in the present. So there are, are a lot of video games that offer a sense of activity, safety, manageable repetition, control uh, in ways that the economy can no longer promise even for a white middle class that it once served in the United States, kind of. Um, and, and we see you know, neoliberal ideology playing into game mechanics in very specific ways. So research management, or sorry, research, huh? resource management video games, um, you know, prop up uh, neoliberal personhood by asking players to compete uh, uh, without end and becoming entrepreneurs of themselves. Uh, and the book gives a lot of examples of, of the ways that games mirror uh, neoliberal logics and vice versa. But I'm even more interested in how games can help us critique and 
you know, and, and model different ways of, of being in the world, right? So um, if, if most games give you a sense of super heroic agency and control, what does it mean to have a fumble core game that puts the player out of control, right? Or if a game teaches us how to succeed and avoid failure, what does it mean for a game to explore forms of physical or economic um, failure without recuperating it into success? So these were some of the kinds of questions that, that I wanted to take up. And then I agree, I mean, I'm pushing against, um, against gamification in a variety of ways. I'm also to some degree pushing against flow, uh, which is this like, you know, like earth theory of positive psychology and this idea that there's like a sweet spot between uh, boredom and anxiety um, that is represented by flow, uh, which is the state in which people are, are so involved in an activity that, that nothing else seems to matter, right? It's the experience itself that's so enjoyable that people wanna do it for the sake of doing it. And so like chess becomes a really good example of that. And video games become an even better example of like an activity that is inherently interesting and, and desirable. And I think, you know, experimentation for me is such an important term because I think experimentation operates very differently from flow. Like you can discover things through a game even when things aren't going well. Like I think about the, the, the speed running community all the time with this. So like speed runners are people who take a game like Super Mario Brothers or Zelda and try to beat it as quickly as they possibly can. And there are like world records and people are, you know, streaming themselves, uh, playing these games at unbelievable times. Uh, so like, you know, the, the world champion at uh, Super Mario Brothers can beat the entire game every level in under 10 minutes, which is crazy. Um, but, but with people like that, in order to like get five seconds faster or a tenth of a second faster, they have to discover glitches within the game. And the discovery of those glitches like doesn't happen through flow states. It happens through mistakes. Like somebody falls in a like down a cliff and they discover that that like accidentally teleports them to the next level. That's an interesting like imminent experimental discovery to that game, for instance. Anyway, I'll stop there. I love that. And I, I want to kind of shift a little bit to the idea of choice, because a lot of times when game designers and people who are playing games, they quite often talk about choice. And one of the like really popular quotes um, is by Sid Meier, creator of the Civilization series. Um, and he says that games are a series of interesting choices. From your analysis, like how is choice approached in the game industry? And how does that differ from how you think choice should be um, in experimental games? Yeah, um, I mean, one thing I won't get into too much, but I just want to throw it out there is I think there's a really big chasm between the idea of choice and the idea of freedom. And I, and I don't think like I, I, I think a little bit about freedom via, you know, fields like black studies, for instance, in this book, but but I focus more on a kind of critique of choice. So, so I think like in most games, the the choice model comes down to like branching decision trees, right? Like, do you do A or B? Are you good or are you bad? Do you go down, you know, path A, B, or C? So it's not always like literally binary, but it's it's kind of binary if you if you think about each each choice broken down, and and in this book at least, like I'm I, I begin by thinking about rational choice theory, which is one of the dominant paradigms within uh, 20th century economics, and. Uh, this was a major framework that was set, uh, supported by the Chicago School of Economics, for instance. And the theory basically says that an individual faces measurable preferences and trade-offs among which she has to decide in order to maximize utility, right? So the economic actor is evaluated based on her efficiency in some ways. And that theory has been criticized in all kinds of ways, right? There's uh, really amazing uh, criticisms within sociology. Uh, affect theory in the humanities has some really great critiques of this. And we see various ways that the economy relies less on choice and efficiency. Um, like we see this in the language of investors talking about the power of intuition or talking about the flows of markets um, that operate in spooky ways. Or, you know, if you think about Bitcoin mining, for instance, to take another computational example, Bitcoin mining is incredibly inefficient, right? And yet it produces value through that very inefficiency. So anyway, back to games, fun stuff. Um, 
you know, like I try to complicate rational choice theory through a series of close readings of games uh, from the Stanley parable to Undertale, which are both uh, uh, very popular but still independently produced games. And, and I think about the ways in which the assumptions that we bring to a choice and the context in which we evaluate a choice are as important as that immediate preference or satisfaction as economists would talk about it. And, you know, and, and, and I think we could become better game designers if we think beyond the branching decision trees. Like I think about video games like Soma or uh, visual novels that um, ask you to make a choice, but the outcome of the choice doesn't actually matter. The whole point of the choice is to ask you to reflect in a way that you wouldn't otherwise, to ask yourself, why did I make that choice and not another, but without, without altering the, the kind of multilinearity of the narrative. And I think there's something to learn from those kinds of examples. Alinda, why don't we pose the question to the audience? <laughs> Have we considered? Okay, so, you know, we're, we, it's like, 6.38, right? We want to be respectful that this event is supposed to happen for like an hour. You all probably have some questions, but you know, we still have more Kahoot. We also <laughs> still have to talk about Patrick's design work. And so the question is, what would you all like to do? One, for Kahoot. Two, for design work. Just put that in the chat and we will somehow arbitrarily <laughs> figure out you what the choice is. After <laughs> having talked about binary choice, this is amazing. All right, we've got two. We got Kahoot. Oh, what? Mm, Kahoot. The Kahoot. Oh my goodness. The Kahoot. The Kahoot. The Kahoot. Oh wait, no. Oh. 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 Mm, design. We can, okay, make both. we can maybe make both work. We can make both work. This is great. Okay. Can we do the Kahoot info? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I think we can do both. We can make this work. Watch. Watch me work. Watch me. So I'm going to go ahead and pull <laughs> up. No, the choice matters. Risk, that is fantastic. But the choice did matter. I'm going to pull up the Kahoot. We are going to do both. Uh, because right now it seems pretty equal right now. And that, um, you know, okay. For, for those of you who might not have been a part of the earlier hack, uh, we have been using Kahoot. If you have joined us late, go to kahoot.it. And input the game pin 179-2776, and you will enter into this amazingness that is gamification, that is Kahoot. We are going to do both. We are going to briefly go through some more questions, which does lead us nicely to Patrick's design work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work itself out. Um, all right. Let's just, you have your smartphones. Are you all ready? I hope so, because I can't actually see anything but the Kahoot. Okay. This is an open-ended question. Describe a moment where a game forced you to make a hard choice. You have 250 characters to uh, work with um, and 60 seconds, you know? I'm, I'm just curious, right? Like Patrick has brought up Undertale as a great example, Family Parable. What are some games that have forced you to make a hard choice? You could describe a very complicated chess strategy situation if you want to. That's true. That's very true. This is your chance to like pull out your queen's gambit. Actually. <laughs> Inspired move. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. Ooh. I know we only have like 15 seconds, only 13 answers. Totally fine. If you don't make it. I think the structure of this question is totally questioning the choice paradigm in a very effective oh, no. and informative way. Just thank say. you, Patrick. Thank you. This is what happens when I work with you for like 10 years. Um, mm, oh, we can skip the end. We're gonna show some answers. Um, oh, oh, some 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 words have been uh bleated. Okay. Uh so in the walking dead, deciding who lives and who dies. Uh <laughs> Yoshi making it to the other platform. Dungeons and Dragons. Should oh, wow. I quit it's, and go it's to It's blocking out kill. <laughs> it is blocking out kill. It is to kill or not to kill. You know what? I'll, oh, that's fine. <laughs> Kahoot, thank you. I'm so glad that I could help you. 
with that. I mean, it's interesting <laughs> that the, the choice is coming up a lot. Like this idea of whether to play a game in the first place is a choice mm -hmm. several times. Oh, exactly. the Animal Crossing one is so sad. Do I let my villagers leave my island so that I can get a new, more exciting villager? Wow, wow. There's some there's some judgment in that one. This is like I'm a, also gonna like assume that that one is risk. <laughs> that one is clearly risk. Fantastic, let's go to the next question. Uh, we are going to actually skip this question because you know we're gonna actually talk about design. So hold on, ignore this question y'all. We're skipping it. Okay, next. Word cloud. What makes a game difficult to you? Ooh. Patrick has a fantastic chapter on difficulty in games. Um, would highly recommend. One thing that I love about the book in general is like it does. It definitely tells an arc about you know neoliberalism, gamification, and what games can do. But it's also it, it's also pretty modular as well. I feel like you can very easily just read some like chapters on its own, um, and you know, it, it, you won't be confused about the journey that you're on. So if you're really interested in difficulty in games, you should pick up this book at your local seminary co-op and read it. Okay. Ah, so getting stuck, platform jumping, banal repetition, mm, adapting, finding time to play. Patrick, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll say like maybe relative to the book as, I, as I'm also looking at these answers. So like a few years ago, I became interested in how, how difficult it was to talk about difficulty in games, right? We have a really great design language uh, to talk about graphics and visual components or uh, multilinear narrative in games or even about game mechanics to some, to some degree, I would say. But difficulty is more subjective and more open-ended. So um, in, in one of the chapters, part of the project of it was thinking about um, a high level of vocabulary for thinking about ways that games can be difficult. And I see some of those represented in the answers here. So the, the, the first kind of difficulty that I talk about is mechanical difficulty, um, which includes things like uh, inconsistency here. I see platform jumping, poor control scheme. Um, it's basically things that involve like difficulties with hand-eye coordination, bad design, difficult enemies, unforgiving numbers of extra lives, stuff like that, right? So like the game is just difficult in a, in a physical sort of way, whether intentionally or not. Um, the, the second form of uh, difficulty that I talk about that I don't see here is interpretive difficulty. So this means that a game might be really easy to finish but hard to understand, right? So that's true, of, especially I would say of art games or independent games. And when you're reading a James Joyce novel or a Toni Morrison novel or whatever, you would say, well, maybe that was really difficult or that encyclopedic novel that I just read was really difficult, but people tend not to use that kind of language in a nuanced way around games. And so I wanted to think about um, how we might be able to do that a little bit more effectively. And then third of all, I do see this form of, of um, difficulty here is affective difficulty. So somebody wrote emotional challenges um, and other things that are, are related to that. And so here I wanna, like I talk about how uh, video games evoke emotions and generate affects in players that include things like experiences of boredom, curiosity, uh, complicity, uncertainty, and in, in some cases, these intensities can be difficult to encounter, right? Beyond emotion, I'm really interested in non-representational affect, including engagement that happens at subconscious or non-conscious levels when you're playing a game, things that happen in and through your body, um, not just in your kind of like cerebral cognition. Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's, that three-part structure is at least for me like a heuristic starting point uh, for thinking about how we can think about difficulty more effectively, not just in games themselves, but also in like player publics and cultures that go with games, right? So um, like when we talk about um, online uh, sexism or homophobia or racism, when people are playing online games together, um, that too is a form of affective difficulty that becomes a really key part of the way that we understand and engage in games with other people. Mm, I love this, ah, oh, so good. All right, this question, we only have two more questions left, but this question is a question around failure, which I think will lead nicely to um, 
you know, it, talking about improv, talking about your design work in general, um, right, Patrick? So describe a moment, you all, when you fail terribly in a game. Um, and, you know, this will lead nicely to talking about failure in your, uh, the concept of failure in your book, Patrick. Um, also, the idea and notion of improv, um, whether that's in game play or game design. And hopefully, we can talk about your ARG work. What happened to my music? Oh, oh, here it is. I'm so rough. I wish I could change the background music to like something we theme related. Saying this is the first time that I remember hearing a soundtrack at a seminary, seminary co-op event. I hope this is the, the first of many opportunities. You know, we love a good first. Mm, show these answers. I cannot walk flash dodge to save my life. Same. Uh, internet, internet connection died in the middle of a league game. Oh no. Got yelled at by the co-players. Realizing the choice I'm making and leading me in a direction I'm not a fan of. Mm. Mm hmm Oh, cut my parachute too, uh, too soon and died upon landing in Call of Duty Warzone. Did not have time to redeploy it. Mm hmm mm hmm Oh, so we got <laughs> crashing a bike in trials over and over. Oh, no. These are fantastic. Side note, one thing that I can do is I can export all of this. I can give this all to Meredith and I, she can share it out with you all as, uh, as participants so that we know collectively what we have accomplished. Well, it's interesting because some of these forms of failure are individual and some are systemic. And I think that's mm -hmm. something Patrick actually explores. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I, have a, I mean, there, there's a chapter about failure and you know, when I was working on that, I was I was noticing that there's been a lot written about failure, uh, a lot of it in economics and the business world, but also, you know, Jesper Jewell has a book about failure in games. Uh, Jack Halberstam has a has a well known book in the humanities about the queer art of failure, and within game studies, there's been a longer discourse about the benefits of failure. Right, we see this educationally all the time, and like Ashlyn and I, when we present together about some of the games that we make. Uh, we talk about games as one of the few areas in American culture where someone is allowed to fail and learn from that failure without being permanently punished, right? One is able to um, not only recuperate a failure into success, but also experience sometimes an alternative way of being. Um, and this is great, I think, except that not everyone has a right to fail in our society, which is kind of like a weird thing to say, right? A right to fail. But when we talk about precarity, economic precarity, for instance, we access a kind of structural failure from which there's, there, there's no escape for most people. And in place of the kind of forgiving nature of, of video games, we find a very punitive ethos. So, so in this chapter, I'm raising um, uh, the point that failure might largely remain a creative process for the kind of owner and managerial classes, but uh, marginalized people, whether, you know, depending whether that's people of color, uh, immigrants, uh, women, LGBTQ uh, folks, the working class, um, don't always have the same right to fail generatively in so many different aspects of life. So um, there are various other things that are happening in that chapter relative to kind of uh, uh, video game failure versus economic failure or precarity, but uh, that's one of the, the payoffs, I guess, of the chapter. I love it. Last question, y'all. Uh, and we can do this. Look at this. What brings you joy? What, what brings me joy? What brings you joy? Like, just like you have like 30 <laughs> seconds. I know. It's, We're asking this because the, the, code, the coda to Patrick's book is, is labeled joy. <laughs> you know, I asked the tough question. I find myself doing snarky answers because of the time limit. I know. It's Oops. like, so 
when when selecting the time limit, it's not sure. Oh, Patrick, oh, same. It's very small. Oh. Oh. Yes, this entire Grant. event, this entire book. I like so to good. Well, I'm keeping this, and this is going to be shown everywhere. We're going to hang this in the Media Art Data Design Center. Fantastic. Oh. Oh. Oh, my face. Thank you. My face. Mm, try. Okay. Let's end this Kahoot. We've done it. There are no points associated with this because that would be real gamification. And I don't, I'm not here for that. Um, but let's, let's move on. Actually, we've got eight minutes. Patrick, let's yes. talk about some of the design work. Let's talk about your ARGs. I mean, I think the most important thing to say about the alternate reality games that I work on is that they're not mine. Uh, but they're uh, many people's and uh, Ashlyn and uh, Kristen and Peter and Evan and many people that I see in this room um, are, are people that I've worked, Rebecca, um, have worked on on these games with. And basically, I mean, I've worked on board games, card games, video games, but, but over the last few years, uh, we've come back again and again to this form of alternate reality games, which uh, which move across different media. So they're transmedia. Uh, they don't tell people explicitly that they're playing a game. And so there's like an ind indirect route into these experiences. And there's a blurring between real life and gameplay in a way that doesn't happen with video games. Um, and there are also games that move between your screen and live events. So they combine elements of theater and performance with elements of traditional uh, game mechanics and gameplay. Um, and so um, uh, parts of this book, especially the chapter on improvisation, uh, came from the work that I was able to do with a lot of people who are, who are here now um, in designing one of, one of those games um, as maybe not the answer to, to how to get around gamification and neoliberalism, but a series of experiments to maybe chip away at that question uh, through practice and not, not just through theory. Fantastic. Maybe we should we should open up for just a yep. bit more. I guess uh, we have six minutes for questions. <laughs> Do it, y'all. Sorry, all. <laughs> we had too much uh, fun. I think um, I think you can type them in the chat, and then Meredith will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really so feel free to put questions in the chat. We'll we'll get to them. Oh, rather specifically for question time. I love that. So every time Meredith <laughs> reads a question, can you turn that on? <laughs> if that's the rule. No. That's that's the new rule. Ah, uh, we have one. Okay. So if experimentation can come through players finding mistakes, what is the role of the game designers in preventing mistakes? So okay, so I I, I had I had said playfully that. Uh, there, there is this distinction in business literature between mistakes and failures. Uh, I don't think this is the only way to make this distinction, but uh, mistakes are things that one could have foreseen and overcome. So mistakes are, are things that generally one wants to avoid because you know that they're going to produce negative outcomes. And because you're careless or something like that, you produce them anyway. Uh, failures are things that you couldn't have necessarily foreseen. They're the kind of like the open-ended experimentation uh, that you can't control in some ways. And so there are, there are benefits, um, uh, benefits to that. Um, oh my goodness, they're rolling in. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, I was trying to see. Yeah, yeah. So, the, the, I mean, the role of game designers in preventing mistakes. I mean, this is crazy, right? Because games are made so quickly, including like AAA games. Game designers will always leave in glitches and mistakes, and sometimes players get really, really angry. So, when Cyberpunk 2077 came out, there were many glitches and unfinished dimensions to that game, and and there was just an outpouring of anger. Um, versus like in any Mario Kart game, there are countless glitches that the designers didn't intend that speedrunning communities take up and celebrate because they produce uh, more interesting forms of gameplay or what uh, Patrick Lemieux and Stephanie Bollock call uh, metagames too. Okay, great. Um, a question from Peter Forberg. Um, what do you want to see more of in future games? Um, I, I want to see you, Peter Forberg, as a as a game designer. <laughs> game. Yeah, me too. Um, I, no, but but I I think um, 
you know, I, I think we've been seeing interesting games over the last few years that experiment not just with um, what you see on the screen, which is important, but also with game mechanics. So I've been really interested in asymmetrical cooperation uh, versus competition, right? We have so many competitive games. What can we do with interesting cooperation mechanics? Um, and, th and then just really quickly, I think at the level of hardware, we're gonna see really interesting experiments with augmented reality, maybe virtual reality, but augmented reality is probably for me, the biggest growth space. Okay, our next question, Patrick, if you wanna take this on, the 30 second evaluation of Animal Crossing. I'm, I'm not gonna do this with Riss in the room. Uh, there, there are too many fans. <laughs> you knew it was gonna come. <laughs> There, there, there are too many fans of Animal Crossing for me to like undermine myself in this yeah. way. No, I mean, I, 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 played it also hear you. I think it's a, it's a really, it is, a, it has been a really important game during the pandemic. I think I've written a little bit like in a piece in post 45 about um, just thinking about the kind of like colonialist and economic um, assumptions about the game frame, but those are different from the way that people actually play the game, which are very positive in terms of like community building and mental health. So it's, it's a complicated game for me. Okay, um, how and when does sound design and score enter your consciousness as you evaluate a game? Where is that on your priority list? Um, I mean, I've been lucky to work with a number of uh, students in the music department, um, including Julianne Grasso, who have called my attention to the way that uh, sound design uh, makes a game world uh, in a very fundamental sense, like produces ways that people can produce meaning through music and sound design. Um, I end up uh, doing less with, with kind of like audio analysis in this book, even though there are moments where it comes into play. And I think when, when we design alternate reality games, we always hire a sound designer, uh, knowing that it's so important to, uh, to produce a mood and to uh, make people think in, in, in different ways. So I, I'll just say, I, I know it's important as a designer. Edith, I think there was one above that, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. From Hayden. That's that one, yes. Um, we talk a lot about player failure, but what kind of failure can happen on the design level? <laughs> It's just, I mean, do you have three hours? Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, so, so many different things, right? I, I think one of the biggest problems is, um, you know, you, you don't, you go into development before you've actually designed, right? Like one of the best things to do as a designer is to do everything uh, pen and paper or uh, to bring in play testers as early as you possibly can before starting to build a big complicated piece of software that isn't gonna work in the way that you want in the end. But there, there, there are so many different things that can go wrong, which is why um, game design has become a field, right? It's not just something that people, people who are in like the educational game space wanna pretend that anyone can make a game and you can just drop biology or English or whatever into that, that box of a game and it works. Um, but like any other art form, it requires a lot of um, a lot of work and thought. And there are some great game designers in the room here, and people like Peter McDonald, who uh, who teach game design in a fundamental way, and Ashlyn, of course, too, and and people like Alenda who make games, which I didn't even I, I, oh, I presented you as an author. Mine are terrible. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, how would you design a nonlinear or branching narrative? What story would you tell with it? Um, I mean, Ashlyn and I are working on a video game right now um, that includes something like 12 chapters and, and various uh, branchings um, within it, uh, but it still has like a level of linearity. The multilinearity comes more in the way that you uh, think through the story. Um, and so in some ways it's more like a postmodern novel in, in that way um, than it is uh, like something that has an infinite amount of choice. Uh, but one way that I like to think about choice is not merely in pre-designing choices, but designing choices on the fly. So when we make alternate reality games, we usually run them for several weeks or several months. And over the course, um, and I see Ed, Ed Chang here, who, who does a lot with LARPing as well, which is very similar in this way. Um, one of the great things about these forums is as they unfold, uh, players do stuff that you never would have expected. And instead of saying, no, that's wrong, you've made a mistake, an interesting design choice is to incorporate those mistakes, those misrecognitions into the game that's unfolding. So being like as open as you can to changing the fundamental design based on what it is that the players are doing. 
Um, so for me, that's that's the most exciting part, kind of choice because players become designers and designers become players, and you're really flipping that hierarchy in in productive ways. I have been, our next question, Patrick. What did you mean by all choices in games being binary, even when there may be more than two outcomes to choose from? Oh well, well I think of as it's still like coming down, right? Right. If you have four choices. Um, you're probably like, you're gonna say like choice one and choice four are absolutely not things that I wanna do. The finalists are two and three, which of those am I moving forward with, right? Like everything like in the end comes down to small branchings. Um, and, and of course, like you have more choice with four or six choices than two, um, but you're still, you're still like making a cut, uh, a concrete cut based on something that's been pre-designed for you to make a decision about. So in a way, like with that kind of game, Unlike an alternate reality game or a tabletop game or a LARP that's like completely open-ended, um, with, with that kind of choice, you're basically tracing the brain of the designer, right? So, like in a hypertext fiction or a multilinear game, you're still like you're discovering something that's already been created for you. You're not creating it in real time in the way that you would if you were a storyteller or or a game designer yourself, I guess. Okay, looks like there's two more questions. Um, do you have any teasers you can share for the theme of the next campus ARG? Um, well, no, because that's like, that's no fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, rabbit holes in this presentation? <laughs> well, I know, I mean, we've done that There is a puzzle in this Zoom call right now. You have to organize all the participants in a very particular way in your window. Good luck. We, we, we've had rabbit holes in the games uh, with, uh, with PowerPoint presentations before where we've like highlighted cer certain letters and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, we're not far enough along on the next one. We did, we did two of these games in 2020, so we're still kind of recovering from, um, from that, but there, there is more stuff coming in 2021 for sure. Okay, and then our last question, then we'll wrap things up. Given your discussion of cross-disciplinary approaches in games, what disciplines do you see as potentially valuable that aren't yet being utilized? Um, I don't have a great answer to that, except to say that part of what I love about game studies and game design is that it allows me to be like intellectually promiscuous and not decide on a series of like disciplinary trajectories. So like, like everything that I learned from a PhD in English and things that I've learned from working with designers or the creative writing work that I did when I was an undergraduate or, um, or like my weird interest in the social sciences, like all of that comes to bear on making a game. And most of that I don't know, right? So what excites me about making a game is I'm here with somebody who thinks in visual terms and who works on graphics, someone who thinks about composition and sound design, um, someone who thinks about like set design, someone who thinks about writing, someone who thinks about evaluating the game using um, ethnographic or, or quantitative methods. And it's so cool to have all those people in the same room working on a shared problem and none of those disciplines being adequate to the task. Um, and that like that unknown is what like brings me back again and again to making games or whatever it is that we do, Ashlyn, I don't know. We call them games, but um, they might be something else. They might be. It's the best word we have right now. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that this is the quotation that you drew from this. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> we need to recruit more people to the media arts and design minor. And this is it. <laughs> well, right, I, I guess that about yeah. wraps us up. Cool. Um, I just reshared links for Patrick's book and Alinda's book in the chat. Oh, so thank please you. support the seminary co-op if you can. Um, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. All for thank, thank you, you for all. Taking our... Next time, Patrick's hair will be orange, right? It will be orange, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Ashlyn, <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen. The next book launch, like, mm, it will be orange, y'all. I mean, I mean, if enough time has passed since the political events of the last four years, maybe. Just we'll don't see. make it that orange. <laughs> this is the time to reclaim orange as a color, okay? We'll see. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye.
Thank you, Ashlyn and Linda, too. Um, it was really, really awesome to see you. And thank you, Meredith, for bringing yeah, us together and, and organizing. Meredith. Ashlyn, thanks for bringing the interactive element. I think that was really, really Absolutely. fun. You have to add Anytime. something to your CV, the Kahoot, Kahoot, Kahoot Wizardess Matthew. or something. <laughs> Kahoot, like, I need a word that starts with a K, and I'm feeling that you all, with your <laughs> academic prowess, can make this happen. The Kahoot. Hmm. Or Kahoot Wizardess. Someone's I do like Wizardess. <laughs> I could be the Kahoot King. Mm. Look at that. Ooh, that's, that's good. Amazing. Thanks, you Patrick. Be... Thank you. Patrick, this book is amazing. I'm excited to teach it. Um, I, it. Thank you also for like helping me make it a little bit better by asking really good questions, especially I'm guessing <laughs> about modeling. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure which was which, but I think you asked questions about modeling. So <laughs> I don't know if that was me or not. But... <laughs> Um, but it's kind of easy because it's you can uh, you can break out chapters or you could do the whole thing. So I think it's going to work well. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye. Everybody go eat dinner at, in your zone, that. right? Ashley, if you want to send me the Kahoot archive, I can find a way to oh, share yeah. it. I, I yeah. want to see that too. I want to share that. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.